皆様、こんにちは。NRW Japan のルアでございます。本日の Logistics 4.0 in Deutz NRW 州、Resilience to Innovation で欧州経済の回復を牽引にようこそ。本日は NW インベスト、NW ジャパン、それから支援をいただいている EWIH 東京、ドイツ・ウィスンシャーズ・イノバーションズ・ハウスの主催及び協催で放送させていただきます。このセミナーはドイツ連邦共和国大使館在日ドイツ商工会議所日本貿易振興協会ジェトロ様からは講演をいただきまして誠にありがとうございましたそれから本日ドイツからも日本からも講師の方々に参加していただきまして、誠にありがとうございました。後ほどまた詳しく紹介させていただきたいと思います。まず、私、ケオクルアは、ご挨拶と説明をさせていただきます。続きまして、NW インベストアジア・オーストラリア南米部長のアストリッド・デッカーにノーパインベスファーレン州の優れたロジスティックス・コンペテンスで世界に名を広げる講演を賜りたいと思います続きまして基調講演としてはフラウンホーファー物流ロジスティックス研究所、フラウンホーファー IML、サプライチェーン開発戦略部長、ドクター・マティアス・パーリングスにご講演を賜りたいと思います。その後、ドイツのスタートアップで今、目覚ましい成長を成し遂げているフラッシェンポスト、SA。のクリストファー・メシーナ様からご講演を賜りたいと思います。フラッシュ・ン・ポスト社のサプライチェーン・マネジメント長でいらっしゃいます。さて、この2人のドイツ側の講師の後、若干の休憩を挟んで、また5時10分から。日本側の講師の講演を賜りたいと思います。まず最初は、このロジスティックス、またはマテリアルハンドリングで世界的にトップクラスの会社である大福社から常務執行役員、インタラロジスティックス事業部長の信田、ひろし様からご講演を賜りたいと思います。その後、株式会社日通総研研究所、リサーチアンコンサルティングユニットフォア、シニアコンサルタントのドクター井上文彦からご講演を賜りたいと思います。講師の皆様からの講演の後に Q&A セッションを設けまして、その Q&A セッションの時にぜひ皆さんに参加していただければと思います。さて、はじめにちょっと私ども NRW Japan、NRW Invest の 100% の子会社でございますが、を紹介させていいいたただきたいと思います
私ども4名プラス研修生は、まあ、こういった形で皆さんの事業をサポートさせていただいて、皆さんがドイツ、NRW 州で成功することができるような支援をさせていただきます。いろんな形でサポートさせていただいてますが、まあ、あのこういったことをやっております。まあ、我々のミッションはその投資と協力を促す、サポートすることでございますので、まあ、あのいろんな形で市場、技術、イノベーションを追って、皆様に最適なソリューションを提供したいと思っております。さて、ドゥスルドーフはご存知のように、日本の重要なビジネスハブでございます。ドイツ、ノートインベスターレン州はドイツの産業州として知られて人口、GDP、海外直接投資でもナンバーワンの地位を誇りにしております。それから何よりも日本のビジネスマンとその家族の方々がノートインベスターレンでご活躍されてもしくは生活されていらっしゃることを大変嬉しく思っております。まあ、650社以上、もう700社近い、えー、日本の会社がノートインベスターレンで活躍しています。すべてのインフラストラクチャーは整えています。さて、簡単ではございますが、あのノートインベスターレン州にはこういった企業が活躍しております皆さんご存知な会社ばかりかと思います。あとヒドンチャンピオンでもかなり多くノートアメスターンで点在しております。重要なポイントはノートアメスターにたくさんのイノベーションクラスターがございます。本日話題となるクラスターはそのロジスティッククラスターもしくはディジタルハブロジスティックス。の2つのクラスターでございますさて、まあ、最近あの、つい今週か先週、DHL は最新のロジスティックストレンドレーダーを出しましたけれども、まあ、今日あの、公演に出るテーマもその中に入っています。えー、ご存知のように DHL はボンに、えー、本社を構えております。コロナのアップデートでございますが、えー、まあ、こういった状況でございます。いささかドイツで今、えー、件数が増えてますけれども、えー、前安倍首相の言葉を借りれば、えー、Everything is under control ということでございます。さて、ドイツの政府も、えー、あの頑張っています。まあ、この方は今、実は、えー、コロナで少しあの隔離。自分を隔離してるんですけれども、まあ、感染していないと思いますがただ経済は自信がある B スタイルリカバリーを予測しているというか期待しているさて以上は私の紹介で少し長くなったかと思いますが続きましては私の同僚のアストリッド・ベカからあのご講演を賜りたいいと思いますベッカーは私の実はあの NRW ジャパンでの、まあ、前任でございますが、まあ、長年 NRW インベストの仕事またはあの民間会社で仕事をされて、まあ、日本通であっ Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Lur, for the kind introduction. I am Astrid Becker,、um, general manager for Asia, Southeast Asia, and Australia and South America at NRW Invest. And、um, as you can see in the next slide,、uh, we work closely together with our daughter company, NRW Japan KK,、uh, to uh, support uh, in North Rhine Westfalen companies is from Japan. In their plans to、um, develop their business in Germany and Europe, and also in setting up a company in NRW.、Uh, NRW Invest is located in Dusseldorf. 
uh, we have 15 representative offices worldwide, but uh, we have a more than 30 years old history of engagement in Japan. And so this is actually our oldest engagement with the subsidiary NRW Japan KK in Tokyo. You can see an overview of our services and expertise for foreign companies, it reaches from business information and advice uh, to consulting and support for relocation, but of course also to networking in business science and public administration. And I'm very honored that I can do this presentation about North Rhine-Westphalia as a hub of logistics competence uh, now. The location in Germany is, of course, also one reason why North Rhine-Westphalia is so successful in the logistics uh, area. Uh, companies wanting to tap into the European market and its 250 million potential customers turn to Germany, and not only for the perfect geographical location. Germany shares a border with nine other European countries, and it is the commercial hub of the continent the place where all European paths converge. Um, more goods pass through Germany than through any other country in Europe. And whether traveling by air, land or sea, Germany's exceptional infrastructure and location in the heart of Europe make an ideal hub for international trade. Um, what you now see is the statistics uh, of uh, the logistics market volume in billions in 2018 by country and you see that within the European countries Germany is by far leading uh, uh, according to its market volume of 278 billion euros. The logistics uh, sector is thus the third most important business sector in Germany after the trade and retail sector and the automotive sector. And about 3 million people are employed here. Uh, in addition to that, Germany's specialized uh, consulting and service companies have developed high competences regarding adequate infrastructure, digitization, and sustainability of logistics, with our, of course, also important partners for foreign companies uh, with an interest in establishing a base for their logistics in Germany and Europe. And with that, I would like now uh, to turn to North Rhine-Westphalia, which in fact is the number one investment location uh, in Germany for logistics projects. Um, we see the current fact and figures, more than 24,000 logistics companies uh, with about 364,000 employees are located in North Rhine-Westphalia and operate in North Rhine-Westphalia, and they generate a sales of about 668 billion euros, which is about one quarter of Germany, which is, of course, uh, uh, also the share that uh, North Rhine-Westfalen has as regards the share of the general domestic product and also a gross domestic product and also population and so on. So North Rhine-Westfalen makes up for almost one quarter of the German market in any respect. Now, I would like to give you in short uh, statistics of the recent development of logistic in, uh, investments in NRW. We see in 2017, we have uh, uh, about uh, 20 logistics investment projects by country uh, of origin from all over the world. Um, this is about the average number up to then. We saw then a slight rise in 2080, especially from Turkey, which has of course to do with a little bit with the political um, situation um, between Turkey and uh, the EU and many Turkish companies wanting to foster their presence in the EU. And of course that also leads to the um, um, enlargement of their logistics activities on the continent. And then we see a very sudden rise of about a uh, doubling in 46 logistics investment projects in NRW by country of origin. And here we see, um, unfortunately, on this slide below France, you cannot, it, it somehow has vanished, but this is the UK. All of a sudden, we have seven logistics investment projects from the UK. And you can imagine this is due to the Brexit, although it is not 
of officially stated, but this is uh, a kind of the result of the consideration of British companies uh, towards the, the expectations of the Brexit to just, yes, we need to have our own foothold and our own logistics foothold in Germany, in North Rhine-Westfalen. Turkey is also still uh, strong in that area. Also important, United States uh, logistics uh, investments have increased a lot just in 2019. And last but not least, yes, Japan, we see four all of a sudden. So I think this is an example that uh, many are preparing, were preparing for Brexit. And now we see that we have 26 logistics investment despite Corona already did it, uh, this year in North Rhine-Westfalen. Again, USA is leading, then Turkey. We have not seen another uh, UK uh, investment in logistics so far, but we inspect, expect, of course, that this will go on, especially if it results in a hard Brexit, which uh, nobody really desires, but maybe we are on the way uh, in that direction. Yes, as Mr. Lohr's uh, presentation showed before, Nordrhein-Westfalen is an important international business hub with many engagements, and that is also true for the logistics sectors. Nine of the 25 biggest logistic companies are based in NRW, and among them, 20 from Japan. Here you see we um, have uh, researched all the presence of uh, Japanese logistics companies in NRW, and you can see the compilation here, which is, I think, a very very impressive image. Nordrhein-Westfalen, as Germany, has a unique logistics infrastructure in Europe. This is the map <clears throat> of Nordrhein-Westfalen. You see in the west it is closely linked to the Netherlands, Belgium and France, in the east uh, to Poland uh, via Berlin, uh, but also to the south. And we have uh, the um, very uh, good infrastructure by uh, water, rail and road, uh, which I have all their um, special advantages for uh, different kinds of freight and cargo. The waterways are especially important to bring a large cargo volume uh, into the country and then from the ports via rail and truck to more destinations. You see the importance of the Rhine River. Uh, now the excellent infrastructure is of course supported by airports, uh, two major international airports we have in Düsseldorf and in Cologne Bonn Airport. Cologne Bonn Airport being the most important cargo airport with actually a 25 hour flight system um, and uh, it covers not only Europe but also intercontinental flights and um, especially also uh, the destinations in Africa. Very important in Germany is, of course, the road network. This ensures that uh, um, just-in-time delivery can be done from almost any point to any other point. Uh, trucks in this respect are still uh, the most important logistics means. When we go to the waterways, uh, we have 720 kilometers of waterways all in all. 20, 100, uh, 226 only on the Rhine River. And we um, have the world's biggest inland port in Duisburg, which is now connected by rail even to China directly. And we have the biggest Europe's biggest canal port in, in Dortmund. And this, uh, <clears throat> here you see uh, the location of uh, the main uh, friend centers. You have the Duisport, which I mentioned before, Lockport, uh, which is the biggest modal port where uh, you can uh, shift from waterways to uh, rail and uh, road uh, uh, lines. And of course, a little bit further down in the area of Köln Bonn, you have Rhine Cargo and uh, Cologne uh, Bonn. In addition to that, uh, Nordrhein-Westfalen also still has a lot of sites to offer that are suitable for logistics, very suitable for logistics. Um, we help you in researching uh, the right location for your um, plans and business model or logistics model um, and uh, the sites are also offered at reasonable and competitive prices compared to the density that uh, of industry that is already here uh, in place in North Rhine-Westfalen. 
Logistics is uh, driven uh, by certain uh, circumstances and factors. Uh, there is, of course, uh, the time of delivery of growing importance because, uh, yes, uh, not so much cost should be spent on um, having the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, goods in warehouses. Therefore, supply chain optimization is desperately needed. And it goes along with also keeping a high quality uh, of the uh, supply chain uh, management as such. And supported is this all to make it really possible by a growing digitization of the logistic services and processes. And a big driver for the volume of logistics is, of course, e-commerce. This is also another result of Corona, where we see a uh, definite increase in the delivery, short delivery result to the households uh, resulting from e-commerce. So Western Europe um, has now the highest share of online shoppers with 83rd uh, percent uh, worldwide. And Germany's share is uh, estimated to reach 103 billion euros in 2020. And um, Nordrhein-Westfalen's share is estimated at 23% um, of um, Germany's 23.6 billion euros of turnover in this area. Yes, our uh, strategy is to strengthen the competitive in the logistics sector through cooperation, especially through cooperation with research institutes, but also with the public sector. And uh, Fraunhofer EML, as mentioned before, plays a very important role in this, but we also have very uh, network, networks for logistics competence. Uh, there is one NRW wide, it's called Network Logistic, but there are also many regional ones that build uh, specific platforms for many industry related top points. And uh, we have more than 600 scientists who work in 180 companies. And in addition to that, 20 research and education institutes uh, that uh, are processing um, and helping to develop new logistics technologies. So newly settling companies will find really competent partners for numerous topics in Nordrhein-Westfalen. In, this is a wrap up of uh, what Nordrhein-Westfalen has to offer and what are the key requisites for any logistics engagement. It's an adequate transport infrastructure. I think we could show that. Then sufficient developed sites for logistics activities. Of course, skilled labor leading R&D for logistics and supply chain management and Nordrhein-Westfalen has an excellent reputation of the logistics sector worldwide. Now, our team in Düsseldorf, it's me and also my colleague Wolfgang Jansen, who is uh, since almost 30 years in charge of uh, doing business with the Japanese companies and taking care of the business. And we both will be very happy to support all companies who would like to approach us hereafter. Thank you very much. We would li now like to move on to the presentation of Dr. Uh, Matthias okay. Parlings uh, at the Fraunhofer EML uh, Research Institute in Dortmund. And uh, uh, please uh, let me welcome uh, him to uh, our uh, event. Um, the uh, speaker's profile here, you can see his uh, strong background in uh, logistics and uh, supply chain management. And uh, he is also uh, acting as lecturer for supply chain management at the Bochum University of Applied Sciences. Uh, Minasama, uh, ano, uh, Dr. Palings no uh, Lideki wa uh, Kochida ni ano, uh, uh, Hyoki Sarete Odimas. Uh, Dr. Palings, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Dozo. Okay, thank you, Mr. Leur and Mrs. Becker as well for the kind introduction. And Mrs. Becker already said a lot about uh, uh, research in North Westphalia in logistics and the role of Fraunhofer Institute for Material Flow and Logistics. Welcome uh, to Japan. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to speak in front of, virtually in front of more than 100 participants in this webinar. 
I hope I can give you an interesting insight of our um, view on Logistics 4.0 and what this has to do with the yeah, um, recovery um, um, of the corona pandemic um, disruptions. So um, yeah, maybe we can just start. I, first, I introduce um, with uh, our institute. Um, our institute is located in Dortmund, um, as you, uh, as Ms. Becker has already said, and um, we, um, our, um, yeah, what we say, we, we are 100% logistics. So what does this mean? 100% logistics means that we cover all aspects of logistics, which means not, means not only the technology, so the hardware and software, cyber physical systems, intra logistics, uh, this is, of course, the core of our institute, and this is where we were born uh, almost 40 years ago. And uh, our head of the institute, Michael Ten Hompel, he leads the um, area of the 100% technology in logistics. Um, so what you see in the background here uh, is all technology, um, um, autonomous vehicles in logistics, um, assistance systems, virtual reality, um, um glasses usage in, in logistics processes so this is all the technology part of logistics and we're doing re research there with with many of those companies that mrs becker has already introduced um, and the second branch is um, the mo mobility aspect of logistics um, you, see, you saw on the uh, slide of mrs becker that we have ports and airports in in northern australia we have a very um good and dense um, road transportation systems. And this is a classic logistics part. So this is mobility of humans and goods. And Professor Clausen is the head of this area of our institute. And the third branch is the management aspect of logistics. So um, um, helping companies having good logistics processes, a good organizational structure in logistics, supply chain management aspects. This is a third branch. And um, Professor Henke, who's my um, my boss, um, is leading this area. And um, yeah, new aspects in this um, area of supply chain management are, for example, the usage of a blockchain technology or the digital twins for supply chains. And I'm also my department is also located in this management area. So supply chain development strategy means, yeah, designing supply chains, finding the right strategies for your supply chains based on your products, on the markets, on the locations where you are acting. So this is what we do um, in our department. Fraunhofer IML is one of more than 70 institutes in Germany, Fraunhofer Institute. So the Fraunhofer Society, Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, um, is uh, Europe's leading um, research um, society uh, for applied research so uh, what we do we do a lot of research together with companies so um, at the iml in dortmund more than 50 percent of our turnover comes from direct um, research investments from industry so from big companies like you saw dhl or Schenker, or as well um, some automotive oems um, but also um, international um, international projects and um, SMEs are also very, uh, very, um, and, yeah, tightly connected to us, doing research with us. What you see in the background here is um, our, our competence center for SMEs. So we help um, SMEs to um, do better business in the logistics, having digitization and stuff. So this is the overview of um, the Fraunhofer Society. And you see here that many of those Fraunhofer Institutes are as well located in, in Northern Westphalia. Yeah, what happened in, in, um, from our point of view um, in, in the Corona pandemic at the beginning of the year or in the, in the, at the end of the first quarter of the year, um, I think you experienced the same in, in Japan. I, of course, we followed that on the news as well. So um, the, um, it was already, even without the corona pandemic um, uh, tough start into the year because for germany as well as maybe in japan kind of automotive industry is is very very important and uh, there was um, automotive industry was going down because germany's 
um, OEMs um, kind of uh, missed, um, yeah, the electrification of the of the um, engines and that stuff. So it was already a rough start into the year, as you see here with the green. This is the German managers uh, purchasing managers index. So it was already below the international um, view on that. Um, but then the Corona pandemic came, and um, in April. At the end of March and April, this was the time of the lockdown in Germany. Um, so you see here that production, incoming orders, what um, are the backbone of this index, um, all went down. So um, that was really a tough time and especially uh, complex supply chains or, or products, industries with complex supply chains, international supply chain like the automotive industry went really down, but it's now recovering. As you see here in July and the latest figures for August and maybe September, they are all indicating that Germany is recovering pretty pretty well and pretty fast. So um, yeah, it's all about the recovery, recovering from the pandemic. And the latest figures even said that we are, um, yeah, better um, recovering than in the financial crisis um, 10 years ago. Um, so um, you see here um, what some of the researchers said. This is more a, a, a V structure um, of the uh, the um, in, um, uh, of the uh, economy recovery, but um, it was a real real hard time for logistics it's because some logistics companies they really had a lot to do uh, in the in the lockdown. Um, all of a sudden, logistics was considered one of the most important industries and sectors in Germany because yeah even in the lockdown people need to get their food and their stuff and and this was some borders closed and all of that stuff so um, we had devastating effects on the manufacturing industry especially the automotive industry and logistics suffered a lot from that but on the other hand logistics became very important in other and um, basic needs uh, fulfilling basic needs of the um, of German people and international supply chains. Uh, the purchasing managers say that the um, return to normal commercial activity is expected to last until yeah, 20, 2021. But that is, of course, mm, very different uh, looking at different branches. What I, in my personal opinion, see is that many, many of our hidden champions and the SMEs um, Mr. Lur had a nice slide on the hidden champions in Northern Westphalia. Uh, they are really um, going up again. They are doing projects, research projects, and all of that stuff again. But many big companies, OEMs, um, automotive manufacturers, um, steel, manuf uh, steel producers, they are really suffering a lot. And they, um, yeah, seeing their return to normal activity, commercial activity is really expected to start in 2021. So uh, it is very difficult to predict when this return of normality is, is, is happening. And that has many challenges for, to reconfigure your supply chains, as you see on this slide. So the unpredictable development of the demand is one of, um, is, is one of the most important things for supply chains. Um, and in my doctoral thesis, I analyze this concerning innovate, innovative products where you also have the challenge that the um, demand development is very unpredictable. And now you have that in industries where normally you have a very good predictable demand, demand for example, in automotive industry. And now you, you do not know when other economies are starting again, um, or how, how people react on that, how willing they are to invest in, in cars, for example. Um, so the development of the demand is very unpredictable. Um, then you have the asynchronous restart of supply chains, which means in some countries, supply chains and manufacturers can start again. And in some parts, you cannot start again. And if you have complex supply chains, as in the automotive industry, where parts come from all over the world, it's very hard to get uh, all the parts back. Um, you have dramatically higher delivery and lead times and develop, yeah, that is because all the supply chains are disrupted. Uh, there's no normal uh, timetables anymore. So it's very tough to estimate the delivery times. Um, some supply chain partners are going in bankruptcy, insolvency. And the other part is 
new working structures. Yeah, it's hard for many SMEs in the logistics sector that you have more home office staff. Um, they are not used to that. So those are all the challenges. But um, how can we solve? Uh, what would the uh, solutions look like? So you need more transparency in supply chains. So we in supply chain research, since more than 20 years, are always saying we need more transparency. And now it's really time that you see those companies, those supply chains, who have a lot of transparency on where their um, where their products are, where their trucks are. Um, it's very. Um, it's very good when you have a lot of transparency in there and you need that because you need the transparency to um, yeah, to react on these changing demands on, 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 on disruptions in the transportation infrastructure. You need a lot of collaboration working together with other companies. Maybe you need more suppliers. Um, you always need to evaluate the political and economic, economic developments in Europe, in the world. Um, and you need to be very flexible in, um, in um, balancing the needs and capacities. Yeah, and the flexible restart planning. So how would you do that? How can you achieve those, um, those, um, those solutions? Um, and digitization, of course, is one of the main aspects. Here are some statements of uh, some major German um, um, yeah, research and ministers. So one, uh, the president of the Architect, which is the German Academy for Technical uh, Sciences. Um, uh, and Mr. Streibich has said that the current crisis has drastically accelerated the reali realization of the benefits of digitization, but also showed how much still needs to be done. So there's a Topic, it, it has been a topic for more than five to six years now that Germany is really behind in the digitization process. So many of our traditional companies are still, yeah, it's, it's tough for them to really get into the digitization to do more than just online shopping and stuff like this, but to digitize their, their processes, to have um, virtual twins for anything. So that's very important for them. Um, and um, so this is a really a wake up call for digitization as for example, um, one of the leading um, um, representatives of the digitization branch, Mr. Berg says. So it is a wake up call to push ahead massively with digitization. And our Ministry for uh, Economic Affairs here in, in North Australia, Professor Pinkwart has said, we are facing a new stage in the digitization of the economy. Technologies such as blockchain, the internet of things or artificial intelligence are fundamentally changing the way we do, do business. So this is an aspect that already was, was on the table before the Corona pandemic came, but together with the other um, developments now, it is now time to act there. So um, measures by German industry in response to the Corona crisis say, most people say, most responses are um, that the digitization of the company needs to be increased. It is now the time to increase the digitization. And this is next to the other things that um, Mrs. Beck already said, like just such as like rationalization, business model changes, new suppliers, but the digitization is the most important factor in recovering um, from the corona pandemic. And um, what does that has to do with uh, logistics and supply chain management? What are the main topics here from a research point of view? Um, of course, risk management um, is a very important uh, factor now, re the resilience in supply chains, um, because such a pandemic always shows, uh, yeah, how how tightly connected supply chains are and how resilient or not re resilient they are. So risk management is very important. But all the other aspects here on the table uh, on the on the chart have to do with digitization. Um, so um, supply chain collaboration, data sovereignty. Um, is a very important um, aspect in Germany and in Europe now. Maybe you've heard about the Gaia X and the industrial data spaces. 
Um, this is as all to do with data sovereignty, interchanging data, but having keeping the data sovereignty for different companies. And smart contracts are very important in the blockchain aspect. So with smart contracts, you can those administrative processes, financial processes can be rationalized. Um, the digital twins and smart logistics. Um, so those are the some of the main future topics. And maybe on the next slide, I will give you a short introduction to the digital twins. So the NASA defined the digital twin as a simulation of a vehicle or system that uses the best available physical models or to mirror the life of its flying twin. So the digital twin here, of course, aerospace related, but um, um, you see digital twins in production a lot, um, especially uh, in Germany, I've seen a lot of digital twins in the electronic industry and maybe in Japan, we have the same here because they have very modern um, production sites and um, digital twins are um, yeah, kind of state of the art there, but a real digital twin of the supply chain where it's a mirror of the life of the supply chain, this is uh, this is um, yeah, kind of um, kind of a switching point in the supply chain of manufacturers, suppliers, and customers. Um, OEMs and supply chains that have a digital twin of the of their supply chain, they they can have more transparency in there. They are more flexible on reacting. They can simulate the effects of different um, um, different. Um, uh, decisions they take. So the digital twin is um, a digital profile of the historical and the current behavior of a physical system. So here in the supply chain. So um, yeah, investing in the digital twin is now one of the main topics um, in supply chain management. And on the next slides, uh, you see uh, what you need um, for a digital twin or what, what makes this possible in supply chains because IoT devices in the industry 4.0, they are an integral part of the, of the uh, digital twin because they make it possible that you have a real-time digital twin uh, of your supply chain. So using intelligent containers or, um, or vehicles um, in intra-logistics and in supply chains, they have sensors. As you see here, we have developed uh, those uh, narrowband IoT sensors with the German telecom. Um, that makes it possible that with those IoT devices, if you get the data from them, if you, um, then you can make a real digital twin of that. So um, those, those IoT devices um, are integral part of a, supply, of, a, of a digital twin. And, but to connect that and to make it make autonomous decisions and autonomous processes in a supply chain, the blockchain technology is, um, is a very integral part for that, it's very important. So we, we connect now the supply chain aspect and the blockchain with smart contracts with IoT devices. So blockchain can connect different IoT applications and enable smart object control. And um, the German Ministry of uh, no, the North Westphalian Ministry of Economic Affairs, led by Professor Pinkwart, has just opened um, um, or um, gave us a project at the front of IML for the European B Blockchain Institute. And it is located here in, in Dortmund at the front of IML. So we are developing solutions for supply chain management. Um, for smart logistics processes, supply chain processes based on blockchain technology. And of course, industry, not only European industry, but from all over the world is invited to work together with us on the blockchain technology usage in supply chain management. So you see here um, how that might work all together on a shop floor and on the next slide, um, you see the bigger picture that we have. So. What we see is you have you have shadow supply chain and you have platform economy and you have IoT devices, um, you have cloud technology, and that all together leads us to the idea that we would have 
an ecosystem, the silicon economy. So the silicon economy um, is should be our German way answer answer to the big uh, companies now coming from China, from from the US that have platforms like Amazon, Microsoft, um, Facebook, and all that stuff. But we in Germany think that B2B, in the B2B area, you do not have one big leading uh, platform, but you need an open-minded um, collaboration of different platforms, um, open source software, so that we have a, a good economic structure, um, the silicon economy, and that has different levels. You have the technical level, which is contains IoT devices, blockchain programs, you have the operation operating level, so logistics broker for the logistics processes, and of course, entrepreneurial level, so new business models on that. And to the uh, silicon economy, which is a very big project now where we are developing um, open source software for different typical um, logistics processes, um, and this is funded by a German Ministry for Infrastructure and Traffic. So next slide, but what, what we are doing for SMEs, maybe that's always an interesting aspect because um, yeah, sometimes when, when, when uh, Japanese companies open, for example, a branch in Germany, they are kind of an SME in Germany. So how can we support them in, in digitization aspects? Um, we have um, in Germany 26 SME competence centers in Germany. I am running one of those and located in Dortmund, and it's the biggest one in Germany. Um, and uh, our goal is to support SMEs um, in Germany with digitization expert. Um, and um, who is behind uh, this digitization competence center? It is maybe the strongest partners in research for, for industry 4.0, which is in Aachen, the RWTH Aachen, uh, which is yeah, one of Germany's best universities for mechanical engineering. Um, then we have in Dortmund in the metropolitan area Ruhr, the front of IML and the already mentioned uh, Effizienz Cluster Logistics Ruhr. And in Ostwestfalen Lippe, which is <laughs> the area where many, many um, hidden champions in, 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 in North Westphalia are located. They cover the intelligent technical systems, uh, IoT devices. Um, so these, these partners together um, support SMEs in North Westphalia um, in the digitization process. Thanks for giving me the possibility to, to speak here. I hope um, it gave you a short introduction uh, on what we think. Um, supply chain management, logistics has to face now. Do not hesitate, please do not hesitate to contact me. Um, Dr. Parlings, uh, thank you so much for this excellent presentation. Sate, uh, uh, ドイツのスタートアップで、あの、フラッシュポストSAという会社のクリストファー・メッシーナ様に、え、ご講演賜りたいと思います。ま、え、メッシーナ様は、ヘッドオブサプライチェーンマネジメントアットえ、フラッシ
our business and how we took the logistic 4.0 approach into practice in the past. And I'm uh, very proud to give you a brief introduction in our daily business and how we use the digitization and the individual opportunity of Logistic 4.0 to, to change the market in Germany. I would like to start with a high-level introduction of uh, Flash and Post DE. So what are we doing? Um, actually, um, Flash and Post DE is Germany's leading online supermarket. So we provide um, all the stuff like food, non-food, beverages, um, with an e-commerce approach. And we have combined it with an instant delivery uh, service nationwide. That means, um, as you see in, in the pics, so you can uh, place an order um, by an app or online web-based. So very easy, very convenient. Uh, you, can, you can place um, a typical order um, for beverages, food and non-food products. And within 120 minutes, um, you will receive the products at home um, with a full service approach, for example. So we were founded in 2016. And today we have, as you see on the right side, uh, we have more than 8,000 employees nationwide. We have um, more than 1,300 uh, vehicles. We have just opened our um, hub number 23 in North Rand, Australia. And we have more than two and a half million orders a year and round about 1.5 thousand products per delivery hub. So, and um, so Flash and Post was the first um, service provider for these, um, for these uh, uh, products and services. And for this reason, um, we are the leading service provider in Germany. So, and I would like to talk about Logistic 4.0. So why is Logistic 4.0 so important for our business? And what are the major requirements if you want to place a Logistic 4.0 concept into practice? So the first point is Logistic 4.0 is scalability. So everybody's talking about scalability, but the question is what is scalability um, when you talk about Logistic 4.0? So, and the answer is scalability is the ability to reproduce a process as well as the required infrastructure on your fingertip. That means um, the infrastructure and the process structure you, you build needs to be so standardized and digitized that you can copy paste this infrastructure day by day. This is to show you how scalable we have designed our logistics processes. So in 2016, we have started with our first hub in Münster. So we, we wanted to check out if this service is, is uh, market ready. So if it's the right product for the market, if the customers like the products and the services in 2016, we were less than 20 employees and we tested the first hub. So it was pretty successful. And in 2017, we have opened our second hub just to, just to check out if it's a, a concept that is, has the market readiness to become a player nationwide. So we went to Cologne. Cologne is one of the biggest cities um, in, in Germany. And we said, okay, if it works in Cologne, uh, it will work in Düsseldorf and in, in North Rhine Westphalia and in Berlin and everywhere else in Germany. So, and um, in 2018, we opened nine hubs. We followed through the, the expansion process and we wanted to build a, a, um, a network in Germany that um, covers the most important cities to get a feeling about how the market takes a pretty innovative logistic 4.0 process and it was pretty successful and in, in 2019 and 20 so we have opened one hub a month so one delivery hub um, just to, to give you an imagine one delivery hub is round about 10,000 square meters with more than 500 employees and covers at least five to ten cities that means so we have opened one delivery hub per month this is what we 
mean uh, when we talk about scalability. So we are able to, to reproduce our service um, on our fingertips. So we can copy and paste it and months by months, we can open a new hub in Germany. And today we have more than 8,000 employees within three years. This is um, logistics scalability. So the second point, which is basically one of the most important characteristics of logistics 4.0 is it needs to be super fast. So today a customer, so uh, um, it doesn't matter if the customer wants to wants to uh, wants to order food, non-food beverages, or or uh, equipment. Doesn't matter. So, but the the most important fact is a customer in 2020 places the order and expects a super fast delivery, in an immediate delivery. So nobody is willing to wait more more than one or two days for a product. So the, expect, the market expectation, the market need is, I, would, I want to place an order and within shortest lead time, I'll receive it. So this is uh, one of the most important characteristics of logistics 4.0, ad hoc delivery service. And this is, this is not only the most important fact, this is also uh, the biggest challenges because um, Growing up, building up a logistics 4.0 infrastructure that is able to provide an instant delivery service with the required efficiency, because you know, because also Flash and Post needs to be profitable. So, so the combination between speed and efficiency is the most important KPI for a uh, logistics 4.0 provider. And on the next slide, I would like to give you a, a, a very high level overview of our order to cash process. Um, on this slide, you, you can get a feeling of how fast and, and easy our order to cash process is. So on the left side, on the upper left side, you see uh, the customer experience. That means uh, you have an app, very easy, very convenient, and you can place the order within the app. This is what you as a customer interacts with our uh, processes. On the bottom side, you see what internally happens. So after the customer has placed the, the order, um, the order processing and execution starts immediately and automatically uh, fully digitized for sure. And this leads to the fact that within 15 minutes, your order is on the road, is ready to be dispatched. So within 15 minutes, the complete order is loaded in the car and is on the road on its way uh, to you. And this only works nationwide for sure. And this, this only uh, is, is possible um, due to the fact that all the processes behind it are highly automized and fully digitized, scalable. It's a pretty scalable infrastructure behind it. Um, you can imagine that we have in our headquarter in Münster, we have two guys who can manage the complete daily business nationwide when in a very huge control room, but it's, it's pretty easy um, to manage or to change a delivery parameter nationwide by using fully digitized infrastructures. Uh, so we have learned that after 15 minutes, your order is in the car and on the road on the way uh, uh, to you. So, and you see on the right side, you get an, a, a real-time traceability inside the app. That means you can see where your order is actually. So is it uh, 30 minutes away? Is it one hour away? Um, is it on, on, on its way? So you have all the information inside your app, very convenient. And within 120 minutes, you will receive the complete order. The complete uh, uh, pay system is also digitized. So it's it's the highest level of easiness for you as a customer to get your uh, demands. And this is what Logistics 4.0 is. is um, so how we took Logistics 4.0 into practice on a, a, a very easy business process. Um, and the last point on the next slide, the last point is for sure, Logistics 4.0 is technology. So it is pure technology, as you've uh, seen. Um, 
the scalability requirement as well as the speed requirement requires itself a very high level of technology. So technology means that you, you need to install a perfect symbiosis of man and machine. That means the combination of man work, so hand work, workforce, and um, uh, fully digitized backend that supports all the processes, all the operational processes is crucial to run a logistics 4.1 system. We name it process flow operations. And this is, so in the past, you had a combination of, so one guy managed one process or one order or whatever. So a one-to-one -one connection be between a worker and, and an order. Today, you have um, a worker that manages a complete material or process flow. So you change one parameter in the control room and all processes in Germany gets adapted immediately. And this is what we call process flow operation system. And this is the complete technology backbone behind our business model. And on the next slide, you see um, a first high level uh, what it what what it meant so 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 what i meant when i talk so we have a technology backbone that supports the complete value chain so when we talk about logistics 4.0 and and when i say the logistics 4.0 is our dna then the technology is for sure our fingerprint you see on the left side our complete value chain starting from the inbound lo logistics and ending by the by the delivery so by the by a happy customer. So and on within or well, through the entire value chain. So we have proprietary innovations and technology installed that perfectly interlinks all the different process steps. So you see on the on uh, on the left side. So we have an own truck fleet with a proprietary routing logic. And this leads to a, to a utilization rate of more than 95% in the inbound logistics, which is crucial to run this complex system efficiently. So because as you imagine, an instant delivery is pretty expensive. So we need a utilization and effectiveness of more than 90% to run this process profitably. So our proprietary logic, um, leads to a service level in the inbound area of more than 95%. And this is perfectly connected with our warehousing infrastructure. So we have two R&D teams. We have one R&D team that is designing warehouse automation systems, warehousing processes, robotics, and so on and so on, that perfectly supports all the operational processes inside the warehouse. And we have an R&D team that is designing and coding proprietary software stack, supporting the complete value chain. So we have 50 heads who are coding proprietary software solutions that supports all the processes from the inbound logistics through the automized warehouse system and for sure to the delivery. This is required. So, so this is one of the basic requirements for us to run all the processes with the highest level of efficiency. And last but not least, we have an own delivery fleet also operated by a proprietary routing logic that is um, um, today one of the most efficient routing logics in Europe. So we are one of two companies um, that are working pretty, pretty tight with, um, with the R&D department of Google. And so we have for the last mile logistics, one of the leading routing logics uh, that supports instant delivery on the last mile. And it leads for sure to a service level of more than 95% in the delivery sector. So as you see here, so we have our value chain from, from the forecasting to the delivery. So as you uh, have seen on the slides before. So starting from the forecast, also uh, fully um, or supported, fully digitized. So we have a, a pretty uh, good forecast simulation logic that enables us to predict a customer demand on a 30 minutes basis. So we know exactly how many units 
we will sell tomorrow between 10 and 10.30 p.m. And this is the basis of all the following planning and operations processes. As you see next, the inbound logistics. So we have more than 100,000 units inbound per day nationwide. Um, the complete demand planning logic behind it is fully automized and, and uh, supported by the forecasting tool for sure. Uh, we have around about 1 million units on stock with an overall range nationwide of, of, um, of less than 10 days, which is, which is uh, pretty cool uh, because, um, so we have uh, more than 25,000 SKUs German-wide and with a range of less than 10 days, it means that the turnover is very, very, very high. So we have around about 15,000 orders per day and as you uh, have seen, um, less than 15 minutes, we need to, uh, to uh, pick the order and bring it on the road um, to the customer. And within 120 minutes, the customer receives the order. And as you see on the bottom line, each process step is fully supported by a proprietary software solution that is coded inside. And we need, this is absolutely crucial that we have a perfect interlink between all the process steps. Only with this interlink and with this symbiosis of software and operational processes, we are able to run this super fast, scalable, and efficient Logistic 4.0 process efficiently. If we would take one software stack out, it wouldn't be possible for us to run this business. Uh, profitably. Just to give you an overview of, of how important the technology basis is uh, when you run a Logistic 4.0 system. The final message is, so what is the magic behind Logistic 4.0? Everybody's talking about it, but what is the magic for the customer? Because the customer is in the center of all our activities. So what is the magic? The magic is pretty easy because Logistics 4.0 provides the highest level of customer delight and trust authentically. This is a very important message because when you deliver a product within 120 minutes, there is no opportunity to fake it. Either the customer gets the, the, the product within 100, 120 minutes or not. That means that if you have a stable service level behind it. You provide the highest level of customer trust and the delight behind it is also very clear because you, you place the order, you need some drinks for your party this evening, you place the order and within 120 minutes, you get it completely to your door. So this is, this is uh, customer delight and it's pretty authentic because we have no options to fake it. So the customer gets the products or not. So in more than 95%, uh, the customer gets the, the product. So this is a pretty, a pretty round story. And this is the, the, the magic behind Logistics 4.0. Yeah, uh, Messina-san, Hontoni Domo, Arigato Gozaimashita. Suzuki Mashite, Kabushikaisha Daifuku ni presentation o tamari tai to omoimas. Speaker wa Nobuta. え、広瀬様、え、ご、え、本日 え、3つ総研のドクターミコイノエ様にあのご講演賜りたいと思います。ノエ様はま、あのこういったプロファイルのスピーカーでございます。1995年から2つ総研に入られて現在はえ、同社リサーチアンドコンサルティングユニット4に
、まあ、あの親会社であります日本ツーンの,あの例を中心になるとは思うんですけれども、参考にしながらご紹介したり、えー、お話したいと思います。えー、まず最初にですけれども、えー、我々日通総合研究所をちょっと紹介したいと思います。我々の日通総合研究所は、えー、1961年に設立されました、えー、物流専門のシンクタンクです。えー、親会社はあの皆さんご存知の、あのー、日本通運という 3PL 企業です。でえーまあ、業務としては、えー、物流に関する調査、コンサルティングに加えてですね、教育であったり、あとは物流技術のテストなどを行っております。えーまあ、その他、えー、50年以上にわたってですね、えー、物流に関わるものすべてを行ってきております。例えば、えー、ちょっとこちらに示しましたように、えー、これはあのパワードスーツ、マッスルスーツの検証を行っている様子です。ちょっとこれは4、5年前の写真になるんですけども、まあ、こういった機器の検証であるとか、物流に関わるですね、そういったものを行ったりしています。で上の4枚の写真は私が、えー、イノフィスさんのマッスルスーツを着て荷物を持っているところです。はいでえー、次にですねあの、こちら NRW 集と、えーまあ、3つグループの関わりと。いうことで、えー、少しご紹介したいと思います。えー、NRW 州のあのデュッセルドルフにはですね、えー、日本通のヨーロッパのヘッドオフィスがございます。えー、それとあと、えー、ドイツニッツの、えー、本社も、えー、NRW 州の、えー、メンヘングランドバッハに、えー、あるというので非常につながりが深い、えー、企業グループとなっています我々は。でまた、えー、2016年なんですが。ドルトムント工科大学の修士の学生をインターンシップとして受け入れておりですね約5ヶ月間日本だけでなくアジアの各物流拠点であるとか物流の様子をレポートしてもらって論文にまとめてもらったりというようなこともしておりましてあと NRW 氏の先ほどあのロイル社長がおっしゃったように IML の訪問なども行っております。それでは、えー、本題の方に入らさせていただきます。えー、皆さんごあのご承知のようにもう日本の労働力人口というのは、えー、もう減少が進んでいると。でそれに加えてですね物流産業ではこの右側のグラフになるんですけれども、えー、労働者の賃金が非常に低いと。労働力人口が減っている上に労働者の賃金が低いということで物流での人手不足というのが非常にもう顕在化しているこれが大きな課題になっているという現状が挙げられますそれと一方ですね物流では最近も KPI ということでいろんな指標を荷主さんであるとかメーカーさん等が導入してきています多岐にわたり導入してきていますまあ、なんといっても KPI というのはあの、えー、データがなければ、えー、話になりません、まあ、そういうことでデータを取るためにはやはり物流も自動化していかないといけないということで進んできたのもまた一つの事実であります、まあ、こういった潮流が、えー、こう20年ぐらいですね特に KPI については進んできているのかなというのが、えー、我々の実感ですで、えー、もう一つのちょっと観点から、えー見たいものといたしまして、えーまあ、日本における物流の自動化とその特徴ということで、えー、これは標準化といった観点から日本と欧州の考え方の違いを、えー、見ていきたいと思います。で、我々はあのまあいろんなメーカーさんを見させていただいた感想といたしましてはですね、えーまあ、欧州、まあ、アメリカも含めてなんですけども、機械が主で働き、人間がそれをサポートする。いったような思想がかなり行き渡っていると。それに対して日本では人間が主でそれを機械がサポートするといったような形が多いということが挙げられます。物流業務で人間の依存度が高いというのが日本の特徴なのかなと。これはそれぞれメリット、デメリットがあります。ただ、えー、これから人間が少なくなってくる中で、日本型っていうのはなかなか、えー、デメリットの方が目立ってくるようになってしまって、えー、今後どうしたらいいのかというような
会計からも一つ自動化というものが挙げられると。それと、えー、もう一つは標準化ということで、えー、こちらにフールプルーフとフェールセーフという考え方が、えー、挙げられています。で日本の場合は特にですね、間違いをなくすために全力を尽くすと、えー、言ってみればですね、まあ、もちろんそこに投資もします。えーまあ、要するに 100% を目指そうという思想がかなり強いと。でえー、一方、まあ、海外で見るとです、ねえー、一定の、ま、間違いを許容してそれに対して発生した時の対処に注力したり投資をしたりするという傾向もあると、まあ、こういう考え方の違いも技術開発のスピードに影響してきますので、えーまあ、そういったものが影響として自動化の開発にも出てくるものじゃないかというふうに我々は考えています。まあ、あんまり完璧主義にこだわるとその技術開発のスピードもなかなか上がってこないというのが現状なのかなというように感じております。でえーまあ、そういった背景をもとにですね、まあ、日本、えーまあ、EU、えー、アジアといったものをロジスティックス 4.0 をベースにした考え方というのをこちらに参考に記載しています。ちょっと細かいところについてはですねまたあのホームページ上にアップされたときにご確認いただければと思います。で、えーまあ、最後にあの最後といいますかですねまずはあのサマリーとしてどんな特徴が日本の自動化にあるのかというのを一旦、えー、箇条書きでまとめてみたいと思います。ここで挙げましたようにやはりカスタマイズの思考が大きくですね、まあ、あの一つはシェアリングビジネスがなかなか普及しないであるとか、えー、そういった課題もあるんですけれどもなかなか標準化されないのでみんながいろいろと一緒になってっていうのが難しいと独立どっぽでいくただ今後は人手不足解消であるとかコストメリットっていうものが強く打ち出されることで変わる可能性はあるのかなとでそれとですね、えー、あと人のハンドリングですねあの先ほどもあの積み付けの、えー、映像出てましたけれども大福さんの、えー、特に人のハンドリングというのは、まあ、自動化としては最後になっていくのかなとそれよりも先にまず搬送のオペレーションの自動化であったり、えー、次いで搬送プラス保管の自動化というような形で進んでいって、えー、まず全自動化をなかなか一気に全部進めるっていう企業さんはまだあまり国内ではないのかなというふうに考えています。じゃあ具体的に倉庫の中ではじゃあどんなような自動化が進んでいるのというのを、まあ、機器などをご紹介しながら見ていきたいと思います。で、えー、我々としてはですねあの、まあ、今回ちょっと時間も短いので倉庫内の、えーまあ、搬送プラス保管に焦点を当ててですね3つのタイプに分けています。1つは上から見ていきます棚搬送型と棚運搬型ですね。えー、その2番目がケースの搬送型、3番目が自動倉庫型と。で、棚搬送型というのは、えー、ピッキングする人の前までロボットが棚を運搬して、えーまあ、オーダーがかかった商材のみ人がピックをして、その棚はまたロボットにより保管エリアに戻されると。で、ケース搬送型は、出荷されるケースロボットが、えーケースをロボットが運搬して、えー、そこのエリアにいる人がオーダー品を入れていく仕組みと。でまた自動,搬自動倉庫型は、まあ、棚搬送型と考え方は似てるんですけども垂直方向まで高く保管されている自動倉庫を自動倉庫からオーダーのかかった製品をのケースを取り出して、えー、そこから人がピックすると。えー、大まかに分けると今まあ来ないで。えー搬送ピック保管等をです、ね、分類するとこのような形になるのかなと。で、ここでは特に国内で導入されている事例というのを挙げております。えーまあ、次のページが、えー、メリット、デメリットも、えー、整理したものになります。まあ、本当にこれ一部なので、えーまあ、ご参考にしていただければと。で特に一つ例を挙げますと、この中にラピュタロボティクスというビンムーブロボット、要するに棚を搬送してくるロボットなんですけども、実は我々日本ツーングループなどでもですね、今年導入して、えーまあ、今後もこういう小物の保管ピックには、えー、広げていこうと考えている一つのシステムであります。でもう一つ、こう数年で目立つ特徴的な部分はですね、えーまあ、海外のメーカーが本当に増えていると
、えー、ここにも挙げてますようにグレーオレンジはインドですしギークプラスは中国ですし、まあまあ、ニヌシさんサンピエルさんもまあ国産にはこだわらないというような傾向がだんだん強くなってきているということも考えられます。でまあ、じゃあこういったものがどういった、えー、オペレーション、庫内のオペレーションで、えー、利用されているかというのをちょっと見てみますと、えーまあ、これ、左からアンロードからぐるっと U 字型に回ってストレージからローディングまでの流れになっています。えー、入出荷時の積み込みとろろしでは、まあ、ローディングマシーンのようなもの、まあ、こういったものは実際導入事例はまだ少ないようです。検品工程では画像認識技術を使ったソリューションの導入というのがいくつか認められる。バーコード検品だけでなく画像認識等を用いたもの。で校内運搬では AMR などを加えて、牽引型 AGV など、まあ、自動化の選択肢が多い工程になっています。まあ、キャリングって書いてあるところですね。で次に、えー、一番肝になる部分なんですが、保管ピッキングの部分は、えー、GT、まあ、グッズトゥーパーソンの1、2、3て、えー、してますけれども、えー、自動倉庫型のものも結構増えてきているのかなというような傾向があります。でまあ、特にこの赤枠で示した部分については、こう5年でぐらいで一気に普及した感があります。では、えーまあまあ、日本の,あの状況から見るとです、ね、まず最初、私もやっぱり感じたのがです、ね、オートストアだったんですね。やはりあの私も2015年に海外の展示会で初めて見たんですが、まあ、面白いなと、まるでコンテナヤードを倉庫にしたような仕組みだなと、まあ、海洋大国のノルウェーだから、こう上に積み重ねて上から取っていって、荷繰りするっていうのは、やっぱり一つ考え方はあるのかなと、で日本でもまあ2016年に、えー、まあ最初の会社さんが倉庫で導入されてから、やっぱり全く間に増えていったと。でまあ、もちろん人の移動をなくしたいであるとか、えー、特に土地のない日本では保管効率を上げたいという2つを同時に解決するというのが大きな気になったのかなと、えーまあ、今でもかなり引き合いはあるそうですドイツでも、えー、2016年にハンブルグ空港にあるルフトハンザのパーツセンターでは大規模なオートストアが動いているのを見てまいりましたで、まあ、このようにオートストアに代表される GTP システムがまあ、自動化の主流,主流になってきたというのが挙げられます。ただ、これ、オートストアに限ったわけではなく、どんどん次から次へと出てきたと。で、えー、GTP1、まあ、って書いてありますけども、先ほどご紹介しましたように、まあ、シェルフムーブのタイプですね、えー、イブであるとか、ラック、えー、これは、えーまあ、e コマース系。えー、全体の割合からはまあ少ないのかもしれないですけど、e コマース系がーでよく採用されているシステムと。で、えー、続きまして、えー、GTP、これもグッズ2パーソンの2で、まあ、ASR、SR の自動倉庫タイプのものとで。最初はオートストアがもうどんどん行くのかなと思っていたんですけども、まあ、今年になっていろいろと、えー、こちらに書いてありますように、えーロボットカートが倉庫内を走り回ってピッキング作業者のところまで商品を運んできてくれるような、えー、3次元移動型の搬送タイプ、えー、それがアルファボット、えー、これは、えー、村田機械さんが、えー、ディストリビューターになってますけれどもアルファボットであるとか、えー、下のスカイポッドのようにこれはフランスのエクソティックソリューションズという会社が、えーまあ、ファーストリテイリングさんをの拠点にこれから入れていくということでまあ、エキゾテックは日本にもなんか法人を設立するようですね、やっぱりこれを売っていきたいと、まあ、こういったタイプのものも、えー、大型の倉庫では増えてきていると。あと、比較的に導入しやすい部分として、えー、ケース搬送型のものがあると。でケース搬送型では、まあ、保管しているものを運搬するというよりオーダー、よりもオーダーされたものを運搬するという使い方が主流で。えーまあ、この場合は人とロボットが同一のシステム、同一のエリア内を移動することがありますので、まあ、協調性がより重視されるというようなあ形です。でまあ、こちらにご紹介したのは、まあ、企業名をこう、えー、インターネットで、えー、叩いていただければです、ねまあ、YouTube とかで動いている画像も見られると思いますので、ぜひ参考にご覧ください。でまあ、ここまで、まあ、どちらかというと、まあ、皆さんご存知の事例が。多く出てきたかと思うんですけれども、じゃあ
全体的な潮流としてはどのように変わってきたのかというのを少し、えー、見ていきたいと思います。でこれで見ていきますと、まあ、右側左側の緑のところが、えーまあ、我々がコンサルティングとかの中で見てきた2018年までの潮流といいますかフェーズで昨年ぐらいからいろいろ変わってきています。ですでにですねインテグレートとか WES などのまあ実運用フェーズに移行してきているのかなと。えーまあ、物流でもまあシステムから取得したデータの利用が進んでいて、えーまあ、そうなってくるとデータを持ってる会社がだんだん強くなってくるのかなというようなのを実感しています。で私も過去にドイツでですね、まあ、2015年からこの2000最近5年ぐらいでドイツの出版社のセンター通販のセンタースーパーのセンターあとアマゾンのセンターといくつか見てきたんですけどもやっぱり標準化やシステム化が進んでるんですね日本より。まあそういったところから、えー、なかなか日本がまだ追いついていない部分があるのかなと。ただ、それぞれやっぱりメリット、デメリットが先ほど言いましたね、あるので、まあ、ある程度その両方を生かしながら自動化のシステムを開発するということも考えられます。で、私も今ですね、まあ、ちょっと詳細はあまりお話しできないんですけども、ドイツのある某メーカーさんの日本でのセンターの自動化に取り組んでいるところで、えーまあ、特にそのシステムはそのお客様にとってですね、まあ、ワールドワイドで初めての仕組みを日本で入れるというので、えー、日本のセンターがプロトタイプになろうとしているそのドイツの企業さんでうまくいけば、えー、世界の各拠点、えーまあ、本当にこのドイツの会社さんは全,全世界もうアメリカ南米も全世界に拠点を持ってますのでそれが標準化されて一気に、えー、広げるというような形で進まれていると。いうようよななことになっています、まあ、日本とうまく融合しながら、えー、物流の仕組みを確立するというようなことにを進めているそうです。まあ、こういった形でもう物流における自動化というのはもうとどまることなくもう突き進むしかないのかなというような形で進んでおります。まあえーまあ、ちょっと今回はですね倉庫内の、えー、自動化ということに絞ってちょっとお話をさせていただいたんですけども。まあ、こういった形でですね、えー、日本の物流も自動化は進んでいると、で特に倉庫内の先ほど言いましたように、保管搬送の部分を中心に進んでますので、まあ、今後がまた、えー、楽しみになっていくのかなということでございます。えー、すみません、最後に、えー、もし質問等ございましたら、ですねこちらまで、あのー、このメールアドレスまでご連絡いただければ、えー、私の方であのできる範囲内、でご回答したいと思いますのでぜひよろしくお願いいたします以上です今日はご清聴ありがとうございました井上様あの、えー、普通はこのところで大きな拍手が出るんですけど<笑>あのまあ想像してみましょうどうもありがとうございました、えー、まあ以上は本日の講演の予定でございました。で、あのこれから Q&A と、まあ、Meet and Greet に移りたいと思いますが、うん、質問は実は一つ今来てるんですけれども、うん、メシーナさん、Mr. メシーナ、can you hear me?Yes, I can. Yeah. So, there is a question. May I put it in English? Yeah,、um, sure. In Japan, there is a big problem that shipping containers used by companies are not standardized. It causes a decrease in the loading rate of transport vehicles, t r u c k So, the trucks are running maybe not totally full. In the material you、uh, showed, Mr. Messina, Uh, we saw there was a slide showing containers in different sizes in Germany. So, you, do you have a similar problem with the loading factor of your trucks? Yeah,、um, sure. That depends on the, on the market. So, in the beverage segment, there is a,、um, a market standard. It's not a regulatory standard, but it's a market standard. It's a, a pretty simple it's、um, a pellet. So, a pellet is the standard、um, loading system for beverages. So, and、um, in the beverage logistics, so we have、um, 
we have not really an issue with the truck utilization because uh, um, the truck capacity is 32 pallets and um, around about 1,200 uh, units. And this is pretty easy because also from the from the dimensions, the, the, this is um, pretty standardized. You have a, a, a beverage box, so it contains 10, 12, or, or 16 bottles or whatever, but it's, it's pretty easy in the beverage segment. In the food segment is... Um, it's a little bit more complex. So is as we, we have seen in, in the presentation before, which was, uh, by the way, very, very nice, it's we have a, a market standard that is established in Germany. It's also not regulatory. It's driven by the market leader. It's the trolley system. So we have a, 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 a trolley, which is um, equipped with all the different units. Uh, the units itself, so the product itself, uh, do for sure not have um, a package standard. So the the issue is the challenge is to to increase the utilization of one trolley perfectly. So the the packing logic, um, which product is uh, at the bottom, which is at the top, and what is the the puzzle logic um, on one trolley is is crucial to realize a, a very high truck utilization. This is one of the major challenges within the, the, the food logistics in Germany. So um, if you have only an efficiency degree, for example, of 80% on the trolley, you have a, a logistic cost spread of more than 25%. And this is, this is, um, this is, um, so the, the utilization on the trolley is mandatory to, to run a, a profitable logistics system, a, a competitive logistic system in Germany. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very much appreciate. Um, I uh, think there is uh, also uh, another um, uh, question. This is also to uh, Mr. Messina, uh, second question. Uh, it says that in the, well, Ruhr or NRW area, um, there are probably already a number of uh, 5G uh, stations. And uh, how is the impact, what kind of impact does it have, whether you're on 3G, 5G, or 4G, or 5G uh, uh, going forward? And um, also, uh, do you... Uh, use the, the digital twin uh, uh, technology or the, the, the concept in your work? Um, to the question, um, uh, 3G, 4G, and 5G. So this is, this is uh, very, very interesting. So we use the, the, the uh, available network in Germany, which is uh, mostly 4G uh, for all our handhelds and the, the software interaction. Um, the, the 5G network in Germany is mainly designed for the autonomous driving technology. So for self-driving cars uh, and so on and so on. And so I, I think uh, for the next um, three years, um, it will not have um, a very high impact on the on the current logistics structure, but um, if we take a look um, on the next ten years, I think when the logistic structure will turn into self-driving and autonomous structures, I think it it will be crucial to have um, um, a a five G network which is. Um, which is uh, very, very stable. And then I think all the logistic 4.0 industries have to change their systems to become 5G ready. This is not a question. It's, uh, this is not a question if it needs to be done. It's only a question when it needs to be done. Thank you so much. Arigato gozaimashita. So uh, we will now uh, move forward uh, with uh, to the meet and greet lounge and uh, uh, but before we do that, I would like to thank those of you uh, who are not um, uh, joining us at the Meet and Greet Lounge. Kore kara wa Meet and Greet Lounge ni utsuritai to omoimasu ga, ano, kore kara go sanka ni narinai, naranai kata ni taishite, mazu atsuku onre moshiagetai to omoimasu. Sore kara, ma, Thank you very much for 
案件等は、あの別科、またはヤンゼン、私ども、日本で受けたまわります。日本サイトは、私、ルアのほかに、ヤギハシ、スギザキ、クスキがお待ちしております。次回は、あのまたウェブトークになるんですけれどもあの10月の25日に 5G and the digitalization of production the 5G industry campus Europe in Aachen というテーマになりますその後11月27日に Leading e-mobility in Germany, NRW and Japan というテーマになりますさてどうもありがとうございました。